You know, we don't really even know how to put into words how great God is. But we can see it. We can see how great he is. You know, this doesn't happen by accident. I am overwhelmed again and again and again for nearly 50 years how God's people can be so loving and so kind to one another. I mean, when you see all the people walking around and praying for others and caring about others, that doesn't happen in the marketplace. That doesn't happen on your job. That doesn't happen in your neighborhood. But it does happen in the church because we have Christ's Spirit residing in our hearts, and there is just a huge difference. How great is our God? He is so amazing. Praise the Lord. Well, I just appreciate all of you so much. What a fine gathering of faithful, committed people. And uh, we're just going to enjoy God's Word together. We've enjoyed worship together so much. Uh, I'm going to let you be seated. I want to get into the Word. I will forewarn you, I have a ton of scriptures today. I tried to put together this message, and scripture after scripture after scripture just kept jumping out at me, and I want to share them with you. So <clears throat> I am going to speak uh, about facing life's challenges. And of course, we all have them. And we probably have two major choices. You can either run from the challenges, or you can face the challenges with great faith in your heart. And, of course, there are so many challenges in life, and, and we all can relate. I mean, there's financial challenges, there's marriage challenges, uh, there's challenges in parenting, uh, challenges with relationships, challenges with our health. There can be career challenges. And, uh, but I want you to know that the greatest challenges in all of life our spiritual challenges, and that's what we're really going to talk about here today. And uh, I believe I can really greatly encourage you through God's Word because God's Word is so powerful. So if you have a lot of challenges going on and you don't really know how to handle them, let God penetrate your heart with the truth of His Word today. There's a scripture in Galatians 5.17 talking about the fact of what I just said, that the greatest challenges of all are the spiritual ones. Uh, where Paul says, the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another. It's a never-ending battle, and it's been fought since the beginning of time. For mankind, it began in the Garden of Eden, and really it won't culminate until the Battle of Armageddon. And you know what? In between all of that, trillions of personal wars have been fought, the flesh warring against the spirit. Peter talked about fleshly lusts which war against the soul. What was he speaking about? Well, he's speaking about the classic good versus evil uh, confrontation that affects every one of our lives. It, it's an ongoing struggle that mankind cannot totally escape. Now, you know what? We all desire peace, but we won't truly find peace until the Prince of Peace comes and returns and takes us home for all of eternity. So we need to understand some things. We need to understand that the, the conflict we face, lest we become discouraged and give in to the many struggles and challenges of life. We need to understand the battle that's really going on. And, you know, nobody understood this better, I don't think, than the Apostle Paul. And uh, listen to him writing to the Corinthians about his many life's challenges and struggles. He said, uh, you know, I'm hard-pressed. I'm perplexed, I'm persecuted, I'm struck down. Of course, that isn't quite the way he put it. If you read the Scripture in 2 Corinthians 4, 8 and 9, he says, yeah, we're hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. He said, we're perplexed, but we're not in despair. We're persecuted, but we're not forsaken. We're struck down, but we're not destroyed. And I wonder when we look at this, you know, there are times when I could say, man, I'm hard-pressed. I'm hard-pressed on every side. What's going on here? Yet I'm not crushed because of what God can do in my life. I can say I'm perplexed, but I'm not in despair. I'm not going to give in to despair. I'm persecuted, but God's not forsaken me. I might feel like I'm struck down, but you know what? I'm not destroyed, okay? <clears throat> Paul faced so many life challenges, and he recounts many of them, uh, many of his struggles, and he says, five times, five times I received 39 stripes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. In perilous situations, constantly 
in weariness and in toil, in hunger and thirst, cold and naked, besides my daily deep burden for the church. Now, this sounds uh, pretty dismal. I mean, th this guy is having a horrible time on planet Earth, and yet he says in Philippians 4.11, uh, the latter part of that verse, he says, I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Through all of that, through the struggles, through the stripes, through the beating with rods, stone, shipwreck, everything that's going on, he says, I have learned <clears throat> in whatever state I am to be content. And I look at that and I go, wow, that is an amazing, great trust in Jesus Christ. And because of his spirit of contentment, listen to what else he said, 2 Corinthians 4, 16. He said, even though our outward man is perishing, Yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. Listen, we need to look at the inward man way more than we look at the outward man, or we're going to have some problems. He says in uh, 2 Corinthians 4.18, we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things that are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And we would be wise to ask ourselves daily, what am I looking at? Am I looking at temporary things all the time, or am I looking at eternal things? Am I looking at the challenges? Am I looking at the problems? Am I looking at the difficulties, or am I looking at my Savior? <clears throat> am I looking at the truth of God's Word that's forever settled in heaven? Am I content like Paul, regardless of my circumstances, or am I constantly dwelling on the negative? You know what Paul did repeatedly? Oh, he shared some of the difficulties of life, but he verbalized a spirit of contentment. That's what he's doing. I mean, here we are a couple thousand years later, and there are people being inspired and encouraged by Paul saying, hey, I, I can be content no matter what I'm going through because Jesus Christ is my Savior. And we, we must verbalize our contentment, okay? Okay. I can tell you honestly, my wife is frequently better at doing this than I am. She will verbalize a spirit of contentment and quoting a scriptural passage and talking about, hey, it may look bad, but God's in charge, okay? We need to be people that verbalize like that. Paul also said this. He said, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution, and he said that we would face perilous times during the last days. And he warned that evil men and seducers would deceive many. But through the midst of all of that and the knowledge he had to write that stuff, he still had a spiritual contentment that went way beyond the perilous times and the difficult times that he was facing and that we're facing. Yeah, see, we do live in troubling times, you know. There's a tremendous opposition against God's children. I feel more today than ever before. But it's not really a new thing, nor should we be surprised. Jesus Christ himself said several thousand years ago, in the world, you will have tribulation. But he also said that his children <laughs> would be like sheep among wolves. That's not a very encouraging picture. He says, in this world, you will have tribulation. And guess what? You're going to be like a bunch of sheep that don't even know how to climb a tree or run fast enough to get out of the way. And you're going to be among wolves. I think we'd all rather be like wolves than sheep, okay? But we better not forget that we have a great shepherd who watches over our souls and protects us from those wolves that are out there. <clears throat> now, here's the truth. The truth is you're a human being with a carnal nature. And you're engaged in a war that will be waged whether you like it or not, okay? It's a war rooted in a spiritual confrontation that began really when Satan rebelled against God and was thrown out of heaven. And the conflict is not going to be over until the trumpet sounds and the saints of God are taken out of this world. This is where we live. This is what we will experience. But there's a big problem with that, though. The, the real problem is almost all of us hate conflict, and we seek to avoid conflict at almost all costs, do we not? And many people, many good people, many Christian people, many godly people, many believers surrender to the enemy and accept defeat at the least sign of conflict. It looks like they're unwilling to fight. Others, which the Scripture refers to as God's army, you know what? They refuse to raise the white flag. 
They are willing to endure great hardship to fight against evil. In fact, the Scripture says they abhor evil and they cling to that which is good. I hope you abhor evil. I do, because that's the only way you're going to get through this. In 1 Corinthians 15, 58, it says these people, the ones who are willing to fight and not raise the white flag, they are steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Why? Knowing their labor is not in vain in the Lord. We can do that. <clears throat> but that doesn't really mean that the fight is always easy. In fact, the burdens of life, which you know by experience, can be extremely difficult at times. I mean, I, I could, I won't identify anybody, but I can look at a lot of people here that I've dealt with in the last 30-some years uh, who have gone through some tough times. And, you know, the fight didn't look easy. In fact, it was extremely difficult. We struggle with temptations. We struggle with discouragement and damaged relationships and maybe sorrow for, you know, our loved ones who have strayed from the truth. We're troubled frequently by the sin that so easily besets us and surrounds us. We're, you know, we struggle with the, the political corruption that seems to be worse than it's ever been before. It was, the political corruption is not a brand new thing, but you know what? There was a level of respect for politicians when I was a kid growing up. I, I don't see that anymore at all. You know, we're, we're troubled by the sin, the immorality, the perversion, the brutality, the, you know, the crime rate, the, the hatred that goes on everywhere. It's rather amazing. But here's the deal. The more we ponder these things and the more we speak uh, how terrible things have become, it seems to me the more troubled we become. Now, I know we can't totally ignore the difficult times we live in. But we really do need to constantly remember that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We need to remember that God has an eternal plan for us. What's going on temporarily is not the big picture, okay? While that's definitely true, at times we, we don't really know how to fight or we think we don't. Or we wonder if our efforts or prayers will even make a difference. I know some of you have been there at times. You know, at times it appears as if the enemy just might not be able to be defeated. And we, we say, what in the world is going on? Why is it so difficult? I mean, I've spent times in the middle of the night through tough times uh, telling God, trying to remind him, come on, I'm one of the good guys here. What is going on? It's not supposed to be this bad, is it? We've all been at that place. Why is it so difficult? Well... The door to human suffering was opened by Adam and Eve in the garden through their disobedience. But I want you to remember this clearly. All is not lost. Romans 5, 19, for as by one man's disobedience, that's Adam, many were made sinners. In fact, we're all made sinners. So also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. That's the hope of every Christian. That's what sustains us, really, when the flesh wars against the Spirit. And, and that's how we know that if we fight on, we will win because Jesus Christ is on our side. I, I hope you believe God's Word. <clears throat> the Word of God says we are more than conquerors. I've always loved that Scripture. It's not, oh, hey, you're a conqueror. Yeah, you're a victorious person. <clears throat> no, you are more than a conqueror. I don't even know what more than a conqueror is. I mean, if you're a conqueror, you're a conqueror, but you're more than that. And ironically, though, even though Satan probably knows that verse of Scripture, and even though he's defeated and he knows that he's not going to have a happy ending and he's going to spend the rest of eternity in the pits of hell, he hasn't quit fighting. He seeks only to steal, kill, and destroy, the Scripture says. He's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. I mean, consider how he has attacked people, God's people, from Old Testament to New. He's used temptation. He's used deception. He's certainly used lies. He's sought to produce turmoil and confusion in the hearts and minds and lives of God's children. He, he has attacked relentlessly with discouragement and despair and hopelessness. And you know what, though? The battlefield has always been the mind. That's where it takes place. That's where the fight has always taken place. And, and of course, Satan hasn't changed his tactics. 
He uses situations and circumstances to produce conflict and turmoil in our lives, hoping to foster fear, doubt, and unbelief. I remember many years ago, God called me to the city of Rhinelander to build a home missions work, and uh, I was working a full-time job. My dad owned a supermarket there. I had a good wage. Things were going well. We were filling up our living room. Uh, in fact, we were too crowded. We decided to build a church, and uh, we started uh, thinking seriously about how to do that. And then my dad's store burned to the ground one night, and I was out of a job. And uh, I needed that money to live, okay? The church was not that big yet. We had maybe 30, 40 people. <clears throat> and so... Uh, God spoke to me and said, don't worry about it. I'll take care of you. And he did through things that were already in place. My dad had business interruption insurance. They paid my full salary as one of the managers for the, an entire year. I built the church during that year, okay? And then my dad decided not to rebuild, he decided to retire. The business interruption insurance ran out, and I, I didn't have a job. And so I started job hunting, and I found a Mickey Mouse little job in an old junk store, uh, working part-time hours, not earning enough to do anything. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, I had built this church building because of having a whole year absolutely free being paid by the business interruption insurance, but now I had a church to support, and I didn't have a job to help out. And I, I made a mistake that a lot of people make. So I allowed the devil to get into my mind and, and produce fear and doubt and worry and, oh, my goodness, what am I going to do? So I started thinking it was my church instead of God's church. And when we couldn't pay the bills, I started paying them out of my pocket until I used up all the money in my pocket. And then uh, they repossessed my car because I couldn't make my car payment. And I'll tell you what, I was down and out. I was facing life's challenges. I didn't know what to do. But God is so good to us, okay, if we will simply trust him. I found an ad for a job that was uh, being advertised, Railton Foods. Probably none of you ever heard of it. They were out of Chicago. They eventually were purchased by Cisco Foods. Uh, they had a big route in northern Wisconsin, and they were hiring a sales rep. The, the rep of that territory got promoted to be a manager, and they needed a sales rep who would call on all these accounts. And so I applied. Didn't have any real experience doing that. And there were 35 people that applied for that job. And the guy hired me, okay? And God started providing for my needs in a special way with a great job. There were over 50 accounts. I had hospitals, nursing homes, restaurants. You know, I had everything. And it paid great commissions. I had a company car. I had a gas allowance, the whole deal. And then one day I get a call from the big manager in Chicago who ran the entire business. And uh, he introduced himself. I had only met him once briefly. And he said, Bob, I am really upset with you. I said, what? Why are you upset with me? I, I thought things were going really well on this job. He said, I'm upset with you because you made more money last week than I did. <laughs> and he's the boss of the whole company. Well, what is that? That's God honoring the fact that he loves us and he does take care of us. But we have to trust him when we go through the difficult situations and circumstances of life. I mean, you can give up and you can groan and you complain and you can, you can get angry at God. You can do all everything wrong. And you know what? I wouldn't have got that job at Railton Foods when 34 other applicants were trying to get it. God took care of me. So I want you to consider the difficulties and the struggles of life that some of God's greatest people recorded in the Scripture talk about. I mean, we've got Jacob. He, he goes through 20 years of deception at his uncle Laban's house. He tries to come back where he belongs, and he's got fear of Esau's revenge, his brother. He, he loses the wife he loves so much in childbirth. He, he loses Joseph at a young age. Then Joseph gets sold into slavery by his brothers. He gets falsely accused by Potiphar's wife. He gets thrown into prison and seemingly forgotten. I mean, these are people facing some of life's toughest circumstances and situations. Uh, we've got Moses, 40 years raised in Egypt, away from his family. 40 years wandering around in the wilderness, wondering why God didn't take care of him when he tried to stand up for God's people. 40 years of turmoil and stress leading Israel. We've got Joshua and Caleb who were faithful but still needed to wander 40 years in the wilderness because the people didn't really trust in God's word. 
Daniel and the three Hebrew children. I mean, they've got the lion's den. They've got the fiery furnace to face. You talk about facing circumstances. Elijah, hunted by Ahab, the king, facing a nation of false prophets all by himself. We've got David, <clears throat> his kingdom. He, he's a man after God's own heart, and yet his kingdom and his very life is challenged by his own son, Absalom. But what did these guys all do? They all face life's challenges with great faith. They all believed that God was in charge of their destiny in their lives, that it went beyond the temporary. It went beyond what's going on on planet Earth right now, and they thought about the things that were eternal. And there's countless others we could talk about who struggled great hardship and great opposition. And really, if we fast forward, some of them, you know. So Jesus was right. In the world, you will have tribulation. And you will be like sheep among wolves. But remember, he also said, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Now, maybe some of you have looked at that scripture in times past, maybe even recently, maybe this morning, I don't know. Uh, be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. And you can say, well, it sure doesn't look like you've overcome the world. I mean, look at my mess. Look at my turmoil. Look at my situation. Listen, God has overcome this world, and when we get into eternity, we will see that what transpires here for a few mere years is nothing compared to what's going on forever, okay? He says, be of good cheer. And what we experience in this world is not the measuring stick for understanding God's eternal plan. He has an eternal plan. We usually have a temporary plan. We're usually more concerned about what's for supper or what we're doing tomorrow or where the new job might be when we don't have enough money in the checking account than thinking about the eternal plan. So we read in Hebrews chapter 11, we read about believers who were chained and imprisoned. Believers. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were tempted. They were slain with swords. They were destitute. They were afflicted and they were tormented. What does the Scripture say about them? Does it say these are a bunch of miserable Christians who pretended to believe they had no faith and so the world just ate them up and destroyed them? No. It says the world was not worthy of them. They, hard to understand, I admit, but it says they actually had God's favor. And the Scripture says this, they all obtained a good testimony through their faith. Through the most difficult times we can imagine, stuff that none of us have ever gone through. I've, I've never been sawn in two. I've never been stoned. I've never been slain with a sword. I'm not destitute, afflicted, or tormented, okay? There are some things that come my way and come your way that are not very pleasant. Life's challenges can be difficult. But these people all obtained a good testimony because of their faith. And then we are encouraged to consider their faith. And it says, run with endurance the race that is set before you, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. We need to run with that endurance, and we need to consider their faith. We can't get discouraged. We can't let unbelief crowd in and just squash out the truth of God's Word. In fact, the Scripture says, do not cast away your confidence, for you have need of endurance so that after you've done the will of God, you may receive the promise. That promise will come one day to all of us, but you can't run from it and you can't quit. Listen, we're fighting a battle much bigger than the temporary conflicts and hardships of this life. Paul said, fight the good fight of faith. He said, lay hold on eternal life. That's where our mindset needs to be, on eternal life. It's not just about now. And here's the truth. We can... And we will conquer the enemy if, that big two-letter word, if, if we do what the Scripture says. The Scripture says if you submit to God and resist the devil, the devil will flee. I quote that a lot. I, I let the devil know I know that verse. I'm submitting myself to God. I'm resisting you and your temptation and your thoughts and your lies and your deceit and everything that's going on. And now you must flee because God's word is eternally settled in heaven and it's always true. <clears throat> so we can conquer the enemy. And of course, God has promised to protect us. He said he would never 
leave us or forsake us. I love all the superlatives in God's Word. Never and always. I mean, he makes these promises. It's not, well, I might, or, you know, sometimes. <clears throat> no, never leave us or forsake us. So let me give you, <clears throat> as I move toward the end here, many encouraging scriptures. Just get these in your heart. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. That's true for every person in this building. God is faithful. And if you want his help, he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. And again, you can look at your circumstance. You can look at your situation. You can look at your health issues. You can look at your financial problems. You can look at your relationship problems. And you can say it looks hopeless. I don't care what it looks like. God won't allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. 2 Thessalonians 3.3, 3, but the Lord is faithful who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. I'm glad that the Lord is faithful. He, you know, <clears throat> he will establish us and he will guard us from the evil one. But we need to remember we fight with God's strength, not our own. Listen to 2 Corinthians 10, 3 and 4. <clears throat> For though we walk in the flesh, we don't war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Ephesians 6.12, <clears throat> for we do not wrestle against <clears throat> flesh and blood, but, excuse me, <clears throat> I don't think the devil wants you to hear the end. <clears throat> But, but you're going to. <clears throat> so, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. I'm not wrestling against a weak throat right now. But against what? Principalities, powers, the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Well, we need to ask ourselves, <clears throat> how do we, face that spiritual wickedness. How do I face it? How do you face it? Here it is. Ephesians 6.16, above all, I like above all. That means more important than anything. Take the shield of faith which, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. The shield of faith. You can quench all the fiery darts. And then in 1 Peter 5.9, it says, resist him steadfast in the faith. This is how we journey through life. <clears throat> we resist the enemy because of our faith that God honors. He always honors faith. So I'm going to ask you to stand, and I want to close with a few very important thoughts. Listen, we will not lose. Why is that? Because God's on our side. And you can say, well, there, there will be some people that lose. I've seen people that have lost, but they didn't lose because God couldn't take care of them. They lost because they didn't really exercise their faith. Now, we may face difficult situations in life. We know that. But we will reign with him for all of eternity. L listen to Paul again. <clears throat> he says, he's speaking about himself. He says, our momentary light affliction... How can he call all that stuff he went through light affliction? I would have called it the most disastrous life anybody has ever lived in the history of the world. He says, no, our momentary light affliction, what's it doing? It's producing in us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. He looked beyond the temporary. He looked beyond the struggles of this life. He looked beyond the circumstances he was facing for an eternal weight of glory. <clears throat> and then he said, we don't look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. Why? How can we do that? How can you not look at the things that are seen and look beyond that to the things not seen? He said, for we walk by faith and not by sight. Listen, as I've said repeatedly, we face a lot of challenges in life, but we better face them with faith. Paul was convinced 
that his faith would sustain him through any hardship. And that's really why he said so many of these very positive scriptures, why he voiced his spirit of contentment and faith and trust in God. That's why he said, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And I, I read that scripture and I say to myself, hey, don't quit pressing. Keep pressing toward the mark. You better press toward the mark. Don't ever give up. And then Paul, in conclusion, he says, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. See, we have this tendency to set our mind on ourselves. We set our mind on our challenges. We set our mind on our difficulties. We set our mind on our circumstances. We set our mind on the bank book. We set our mind on how healthy or unhealthy we feel. He says, don't do that. Set your mind on things above. You are on a temporary journey through this life that will become so amazing when it's all said and done. Uh, listen, <clears throat> it's not about us. It's not about you. It wasn't just about Paul. <laughs> it's about being productive in the kingdom of God. Can you imagine if Paul had caved in in the midst of the difficult times he was going through and he didn't say all these positive things he said, if he didn't have a great spirit of contentment in no matter what was going on, <clears throat> where would we be? The Apostle Paul, because God allowed him to struggle through those circumstances of life because he spoke up for God and met a lot of spiritual satanic resistance, becomes an inspiration to literally millions and millions and millions of people down through the centuries right here today in this building. We are inspired and we are encouraged because of what he went through and what he endured, really how he faced life's challenges. So the big question, how are you going to face your challenges? I know everybody in here has some, and you don't like most of them. You may not like any of them. But listen, God is faithful, and we can have an eternal vision that will not only glorify God. Now, it might not get us out of the predicament right here and right now, but you know what? <clears throat> the enemy will not win. In the, in the end, we're going to be clapping each other on the back in heaven one day around the throne. And we're not even going to remember the stuff we went through. <clears throat> You'll remember it, though, if you run from it and you hide from it and you fail to trust God. So let's face life's circumstances, whatever they may be, again and again and again and again with a spirit of contentment and a spirit of faith that will glorify God and minister to us. God bless you. Well, I'm going to ask you to come and find a place to pray. And really, don't just dwell on the negative circumstances of your life. Come and dwell on the eternal like we just heard in God's Word again and again and again, and God will bless you richly. Praise God.